Ingemana, Ingadeo, Ro Rakatida Ma, Tenakoto, 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 Norera, Ko Wayo, Ko Harleen Hain, Tako Ingawa, Ko Te Tumuakio Te Fariwanaka O Takoaho, Nami Hinui Kiakoto, Norera, Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenatato, Katoa. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Harleen Hain, and I have the great privilege of being the Vice Chancellor at the University of Otago. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this inaugural professorial lecture for Lois Surgeon. Now, these lectures are a time for celebration for the university community. It's an opportunity for all of us to take an hour out of our incredibly busy schedules and just slow down a bit and literally bask in the glory of one of our own local scholars. I'm really, really happy to see so many people here this evening, and I am particularly delighted to welcome some important people in Lois's life who have come here to support her this evening. Um, we're joined by her mother, Ruth, her brother and sister-in-law, Carl and Ingrid, and some very special friends and colleagues have come together from not only Christchurch, but also Dunedin and Wellington to be here with her this evening. It's also great to see so many staff and students uh, from the University of Otago Christchurch, and I'd also like to welcome any members of the general Christchurch community who are here with us this evening. To each and every one of you, Nomai Hadamai, welcome. Now, it's not easy to become a professor at the University of Otago. Um, in order to be successfully promoted to this particular rank, the candidate must demonstrate excellence in teaching, in research, and in service to the university and the broader academic community. Now, as you will learn over the course of this evening, Lois has exceeded all of the university's expectations for promotion. She's internationally recognized for her innovative research on eating disorders. She is an incredibly effective classroom teacher, and she's provided exceptional service to the University of Otago and to the psychological profession. On that note, um, when we were considering uh, Lois's application for promotion, we sought the advice of international referees. And one of her referees told us, there can be absolutely no question about her commitment and contribution to advancing professional practice. I can think of no one who has given as much. Her leadership has been calm, considered, able, and fair. So Lois, on behalf of the University of Otago, I would personally like to congratulate you on your very, very well-deserved promotion to professor. And I will now call on Professor David Murdoch, who is going to tell us just a little bit more about Lois's journey to professor. No reda, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenatato, katoa. Tenakoto katoa, and th thank you, Harleen. And, and for those who don't know me, my name's David Murdoch. I'm the, the Dean and Head of Campus here at the University of Otago Christchurch. And it's my absolute pleasure to uh, have the role of, of introducing Lois tonight. Um, Lois was born in, in Whamanui, one of three children. She moved um, to Christchurch uh, just after starting primary school, and that move was prompted by her father being promoted to a new role here in Christchurch. Her father was a, a career policeman, and I must admit, when I, found, uh, when I learned that he was a policeman, I couldn't help but reflect on uh, Lois's skills at investigation and wondering whether there was some familial element associated with that. And I also, just uh, a little bit more searching, had noted that her father was actually uh, quite well known in the profession. And, and particularly, uh, I found a, a record about the start of the, um, the dog handling section of the police, where he, I think, correct me, Lois, I think he was one of the first constables to receive one of the original puppies in that program. Uh, Lois went to Linwood High School here in Christchurch, uh, engaged in many sporting, music, uh, school leadership activities, and actually was, was quite a, a sports person. Uh, was a Canterbury Secondary School representative in athletics. Was clearly a good sprinter, 100 metres, 200 metres, long jump, as well as hockey. And uh, carried, uh, for, uh, continued with, the, with competitive sports through to her mid-20s. Uh, she went to... Uh, University of Canterbury, uh, did her undergraduate training there, uh, early postgraduate training, 
uh, graduated with a BA in 1981, MA 1983, certificate in alcohol counselling in 1985, and a diploma in, in clinical psychology in 1986. And from 1986 has held varying roles in Christchurch as a clinical psychologist. And that included at what was then Sunnyside Hospital, now Hamilton Hospital, um, student health, eating disorder service, and the clinical hematology unit here at Christchurch Hospital. Uh, and uh, as well as the, 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 the clinical roles, uh, as Harleen alluded to, she's had an increasing number of professional roles. Um, and of note with the New Zealand Psych uh, Psychologist Board, Varying roles, uh, complaints assessment committees, accreditation and investigation, uh, professional advisor, um, and clearly developing and honing those skills of investigation in that role alone. Uh, and received a certificate of appreciation from that board for all her work. And also in 2012 uh, was awarded fellowship of the New Zealand College of, of Clinical Psychologists for significant and preeminent contribution to the psychology profession over an extended period of time. She's worked at the University of Otago in varying roles uh, since 1994. Uh, did her PhD here. Uh, uh, was awarded that in 2002. I suspect we might hear something about that in her talk. Uh, the title was Investigation of Core Phenomenon of Anorexia Nervosa, the Role of Psychological Control. And Lois' current role is Professor in our Department of Psychological Medicine key uh, teaching and research roles, but also is the Associate Dean Academic for the whole Division of Health Sciences for the University, and that's a major role uh, with delegated authority in a wide range of academic matters, a really big role. And I think it's very, very obvious from looking at Lois's CV, all of the service roles, apart from anything else. And I think that uh, really indicates her interest uh, and involvement in both that service role professionally and academically, but also I think reflects her, her skills and the demands that others place on her or request of her because of those skills. Uh, lesser known skills, and these are actually Lois's words, lesser known skills, landscape gardening and tree planting, uh, fishing in the Marlborough Sounds. Uh, of her academic interests um, listed uh, health practitioner regulation and, and malpractice, eating disorders and weight loss surgery, uh, brain injury, health psychology, quite diverse. And, and Lois has studied and published widely on, on that range of topics. And so Lois, I um, invite you to take the, the stage and uh, for your, uh, your talk entitled Journeys Through Eating Disorders, the Interface Between Psychological and Physical Health and Health Practice <coughs> Regulation. Thank you. I think you um, probably did it better than me, David, so um, <laughs> no expectations. I, I just wanted to use the opportunity to talk about some of the things I've really enjoyed, um, which is helpful, um, and also happen to be things that I've been quite passionate about, which is a lucky um, association. Um, and the, the uniting theme really is about teams and collaboration, um, and so that's what I really want to highlight today is the teams of people I've been involved with. Um, I could not have predicted that I would have ever done any of these research projects, actually. Um, so you don't want to predict your career too far ahead because actually you probably not do those things. Um, I would never have thought I would be doing research um, when I first got involved in professional work. Um, and I think that um, it's been really good to be able to unite professional work with um, academic research. So I did start quite small, um, and I was still at the desk. I was at the desk. Some people say I still look like that, but I don't think that's quite fair. <laughs> um, so I was pretty studious and doing things and running around. Um, I enjoyed school a lot and did lots of extracurricular activities. In fact, sometimes doubling up um, on any individual day. I did run everywhere, David's right. Um, and sometimes I ran quite fast too. Um, I enjoyed athletics and hockey especially, um, and uh, unfortunately just gave those up as I got really busy. Also did quite a lot of horse riding and um, playing in various orchestras and various instruments so I, one might call it a very unfocused um, approach to things but I was keen to have a go. 
And then I did do um, an undergraduate and postgraduate degrees at Canterbury, and I did this in education and psychology, really just following the good teachers, um, not necessarily thinking that this is what I was going to do, um, but I just followed really inspiring um, and competent teachers. I also chose, partly chose these things because they just fitted around sports, and it is fair to say that I chose subjects because I just stood in the wrong line sometimes, um, and that was fine, I just took that. Um, and I enjoyed university life. I did attend a lot of sports competitions, um, including attending some rather chaotically and poorly run uh, winter tournaments. In fact, I was dismayed to find that sometimes there were no games organised um, at winter tourney, um, but I found other things to do. Um, and I made lots and lots of friends through those things. I think doing a spread of undergraduate subjects is really important and not to narrow too early. Um, so I did do papers in philosophy and statistics thinking, well, these just fit around a bit of sport. Um, but actually they were very, very crucial when I got started doing um, um, research. And I'll come to that a bit later. So it's important not to narrow down too early, in my opinion, in doing academic work. Um, those were also the days of student health, uh, student job schemes, quite um, nicely funded by the government. And so you could stand in a line somewhere in the square for hours and then see what card you got offered for a job. Um, and so over many summers, I learned lots about labouring and practical skills such as painting and landscaping and more painting and more painting and more painting. Um, and I think over the course of those undergraduate years, I painted most of the community facilities in Taitap and Lincoln. Um, so sometimes when I drive past, I just check what the quality of the painting job is now. Um, I still enjoy these things, and um, over the years I've landscaped several big sections from nothing to um, pretty good gardens, I think, and um, I learned a lot of practical skills. It actually turned out that summer jobs also gave me a really, really big break and had a big influence on my career because one of the jobs I had is to go to Mrs Webb then and ask if I could have that, please, could I have that summer job, please? Um, and so that was the summer far, far away, um, and I was interviewed for that job along with a few other people, and um, I became a research assistant at um, what was known as Sunnyside Hospital, which at that time had over a thousand inpatients, which is pretty shocking to think about that now. It's called Hill Morton Hospital. Um, so I was very grateful for Olive, who's here who now, um, who gave me these jobs, and I kept returning over a couple of years to collect follow-up data with a few other people as well. And that break really gave me the confidence and um, idea of applying for a professional career in psychology, which I hadn't really seriously considered. Um, just as well I started to consider something. Uh, at the later point, I actually, um, Paul Glue, um, who was a psychiatric registrar, joined that uh, team to do some writing up of the research, and of course, um, publications from that. And Paul, of course, is now the Professor of Psychological Medicine at Otago. So what comes around goes around. <laughs> I then did apply for postgraduate training in clinical psychology, and I was really surprised to get selected. I, I think I did my interview um, running between some sports things. I turned up in shorts and t-shirts, and I was really surprised that that wasn't the interview, but I got interviewed and got in. Um, and I, um, this involved quite a lot of academic work and heavy hands-on training over three years. It was a good time to be training because we as a group were seeing the, the fading of the old institutional um, treatment, uh, good and bad, and the rise of community-based services. That old institution is now gone, but being able to see the history, both good and bad, um, was really helpful in understanding um, people who are presenting with long-term mental illness. I've still got the jail-like keys to the old grey building. I admit I never handed them in, um, but I don't think anybody would be looking for them because the buildings have been demolished. Um, major teachers into the clinical programme included Ralph Unger, Steve Hudson and Bill Black. And it was one of the first clinical training programmes in New Zealand, and I think, in my mind, Bias Mind, it was one of the best ones uh, at that time. 
And I was really grateful for the many people who supervised me during those years, including many people who are here today and are still friends. So clinical training took six students per year, which wasn't many. Um, we spent three years intensely working together, getting to know each other really well. And I'm friends um, and trusted colleagues with most of those people even 30 years later. We were an unusually nerdy group um, on reflection. Um, didn't realise it at the time. Um, and so five of six of us went on to do PhDs, which was unusual. So I did qualify as a psychologist and I did some short work at Student Health and then I went back to um, Sunnyside Hospital working in a variety of settings including setting up a new service in Ashburton or expend, extending a new service in, in Ashburton with so lots of going up and down the main road um, which is where I learnt to find good firewood um, <laughs> on the way home. Um, so I was in the right place at the right time. Um, I also got a job at Princess Margaret Hospital Specialist Eating Disorder Service and that was and still is the only publicly funded inpatient unit in New Zealand. So it was, a, it was a, quite a unique setting. The service was in a phase of major overhaul and having to rethink how to manage increasingly escalating numbers of referrals on the same number of services um, but with limited you know, resources. So I was very grateful to be given some DHB funding to visit some Australian, Canadian and American clinics looking at different ways to deliver services. Those trips especially impressed on me the importance of doing clinical research alongside um, practical um, um, service. So I started doing a few research projects and got my first publications in the area of eating disorders around the 1990s. In 1994, I did um, join half time as a joint clinical academic um, with the DHB and the University of Otago. And um, of course, one has to do a PhD then, so I got cracking. And I did do a PhD on the role of psychological control. Um, I did this topic because um, it squarely hit me in the face that this was a bit of a mess, really, in terms of what we offered patients and what we said to patients and what patients said to us. Um, I had some excellent supervisors and Steve Hudson, um, who many will know, who unfortunately died before I submitted, but um, he did get to see my loosely bound manuscript, and also Jackie Horn and Libby Plumridge. Why did I do this? Well, um, I was interested in rare things, and so this seemed to be an important topic, as many theories about anorexia talk about control. Um, it's littered with the, this talk. Um, yet, when you look at what these things say, they don't necessarily line up and say consistent things. So that sends confusing things to patients, and it certainly sends confusing things to, to clinicians as, as well. So this PhD involved a lot of looking in um, theoretical boxes. This is what it did feel like. Um, I went about unpacking leading theories and, and extracted the claims made on each of the theories and then set about testing um, how these theories bore out with um, empirical literature. Um, so sometimes I looked in the boxes, there was nothing there, and other times I was overwhelmed. Um, and I also went on and asked other questions about whether there was anything unique about anorexia compared with other disorders that claimed to have quite a lot of um, control issues involved in illness maintenance and uh, development. Um, and I, um, I did this by looking at people with alcohol dependence and diabetes, which sound like diverse groups, but there are some overlaps. And then finally, I looked at the case, um, is that the case that certain symptoms but not others are related to control issues? Um, again, it's a slightly different way of looking at this question but quite an important one when it comes down to um, what you're going to do in treatment. And finally, which was probably a tricky thing for me, was I was looking at how people with anorexia nervosa construct, them, themselves construct their illness and how they talk about control. So this did involve people with anorexia talking to each other, and me, not me listening in, but a research um, assistant listening in. And I had the, um, the need to learn about different ways of doing research, not just 
counting numbers and being an empirical researcher, but diving into qualitative research and social constructionist theories, which I still don't quite know much about, but um, there you go. <laughs> so after my PhD, I was really lucky to be able to extend this work quite a lot for a number of years. Um, and I was great to be able to work with Nerissa So from University of Sydney. Um, and she had active links with Singapore clinics, um, which is handy. And so we looked at um, social norms about control in both these countries and how these different norms may relate to symptoms of anorexia nervosa. We did find some important differences and we thought this had significant um, bearing on um, treatments and, and depending on what setting you're in. So in effect, Western-centric treatments may not fit in Asian settings. But it's a complicated story because we also looked at cultural assimilation. Um, if you live in one country but you're, you're of a different um, ethnic background or a different Asian background, how does that play out in Australia? And likewise, how does that play out for Australians living in Asia? So it ended up being a bit bigger PhD than I would hope for, but we've got there. Um, so we built some cultural specific theory about control um, and then we went on to look at some other things like um, diet profiles, nutritional knowledge and body image dissatisfaction in those settings. Part of the earlier trips to Australia took me to eating disorders and sit services in Sydney and that's where I met uh, Peter Beaumont and Stephen Towers. Peter was the HOD of psychological medicine and Stephen was the HOD of psychology, perfect fit. Um, so both these people turned out to be very important in opening doors for me. They were both world leaders in eating disorders research and practice, and they were extremely generous in, in asking me to join some of their collaborations. So I got involved with setting up the New Zealand side of the Australasian treatment database. Um, so when you're dealing with really rare disorders, multi-site databases are really important to build the numbers. And this helps benchmark clinical outcomes and understanding changing profiles of people presenting. Peter and Stephen also invited me to, included me in part of a group that um, set up the Australian New Zealand Association of Eating Disorders, and that association is still going strong. They also invited me to write some of the teaching curriculum for helping GPs in New South Wales to manage people with eating disorders. Um, so both Peter and Stephen opened doors for me internationally. Um, though Peter has now died, I'm still um, involved in working with Steve, um, um, Stephen and a number of PhDs. Peter's got a bit of a knack of... No, Stephen's got a bit of a knack of ringing me and saying, I know who will do this. <laughs> um, so P Peter and Stephen are also excellent at building new research teams and for me this included um, a, a new research team member in the um, form of Sarah Maguire who these days remains a good friend and colleague. One of the big jobs we did is that we started to explore a staging model of, of illness in anorexia nervosa. So in some illnesses like cancer we already have a staging model which helps us um, predict treatment and prognosis um, and uh, plan, plan service delivery. We wondered if the same could be de developed in anorexia nervosa, especially given that the only historical marker of severity in anorexia has been weight, which seems a bit shallow in terms of understanding severity. So we collected data in three countries over several years. And um, we did come up with a four-stage model which could be um, reliably measured and could predict treatment needs and use. I really enjoyed this work um, as it brought a large team together and um, it was designed to help clinicians and, and think about other severity markers. Building on these international collaborations led to other things. And this is this, you know, the thread that joins all this together. So I got involved in writing teams developing clinical guidelines for eating disorders in 2003 and then again 11 years later. These were very time consuming projects working with large groups of people, um, but they're really important in helping non-specialist clinicians deliver evidence-based care. 
most people with eating disorders are not seen by specialist clinicians, so we need some way of communicating out the um, good standards and expected um, protocols. In the last decade, I've also been uh, had editing roles on two international journals, again, very time consuming as it involves overseeing the peer review of articles submitted to journals and making recommendations about publications or not. So all of these were new teams for me, albeit from a distance often, and unfortunately most of the editorial board meetings are held in ex really exotic places at 2am in New Zealand time. Um, so I attend most of these video conferences in my jammies, um, <coughs> turning off the video so they can't quite see. <laughs> um, so along the way, I was involved in a number of um, organising of conferences and national and internationally. And perhaps the biggest one uh, was that of being part of the Scientific Committee for International Conference on Eating Disorders in New York. This was two to three years in the planning of regular meeting, again, not at very sociable hours for me. Um, but it ended up being very successful with over 1,400 attendees. So we did really well. It was the biggest ever held conference on eating disorders in the world at that point. Um, it's another example of working with colleagues, some of whom you know, um, working with academic strangers and actually coming together from a distance and to a, for a common goal. Other, uh, alongside this, I've been involved in some other areas of interest around eating disorders, such as um, estimating the economic and social burden of eating disorders worldwide, looking at um, how we can cost these things out. Um, are there ways of predicting treatment dropout when people are in intensive inpatient care for an eating disorder? You'd think that might be easy, but it wasn't. Um, and really about the relationship between self-like and self-competence in eating disorder symptoms and how these things are dynamic and change over time. Um, and how does unhealthy perfectionism drive eating disorder symptoms or is it the other way around? So just data that involved um, following up people and looking at relationships backwards and forwards. So around 2003 and 2004 I shifted to Clinical Haematology 0.5 is my DHB component. This was a newly created position for the service. Um, I was interested in this because I was quite interested in service development work, and I'd done quite a lot of that at uh, Princess Margaret Hospital, and this seemed quite a nice challenge. This was also an excellent team to work with, and a very challenging area of medicine. I got involved in some research looking at clinical care delivery and set up a postcode paper on psycho-oncology. And wouldn't you know it, this introduced me to some other roles. So between 2002 and 2015, I've been on a number of Ministry Health Expert Advisory Groups looking at different aspects of um, care. These groups came and went as the reports came and went. Um, so these are sort of short bursts of activity, but at one of these, I met Betsy Marshall, who is the person on the left, um, who's received a Queen's Service Order for her work in cancer care. She later um, asked me to be on the trustee, I'd be a trustee on the New Zealand Cancer Control Trust. Um, and this included a group of experts, some of you will know some of these people who work for Otago. Um, they're experts in public health policy, patient rights and cancer research. We had some initial um, government funding, but operated quite independently of the ministry. We were a bit like an NGO um, advocating for care. And um, the trust wound up in 2015, but it was really enjoyable being part of a ginger group, not being bought by government money, but actually challenging the Ministry of Health about meeting their targets or choosing the wrong targets if we felt that was the case. Um, so there's no automatic leap to this group, but um, running alongside all this work, um, I got involved in another really great research team um, that continues to work together for over a decade now. Um, and this is focused on rehabilitation, recovery from illness and injuries. Um, this included Debbie Snell, who's here today, Richard Seagert, who um, used to work for Otago, but now in Auckland, and Jean Haysmith, who is in um, Otago. We're all from slightly different backgrounds, um, in areas of expertise, but we came together to look at what could we 
bring to bear on understanding recovery. Um, interestingly, Debbie, was, who's here, um, was also a co-author of some of my earlier publications, so um, it just shows you the links that you build early are really important later. And we're still publishing together 20 years later. So we have looked at um, concussion, we've looked at uh, coping and recovery in, in other populations such as um, emergency first responders and an ongoing project with weight loss surgery candidates. So alongside all this, um, I, um, as David's mentioned, in 2002 I was appointed to the New Zealand Psychologist Board. I just applied and I was a bit surprised to get appointed by the Ministry. Um, and this is the regulatory authority which oversees the regulation of psychologists in New Zealand, about 3,000 or so of them. Um, and I got appointed about the time just before the new legislation came in, the HPCA Act. And this was the first time that all the regulated health professionals like doctors, nurses, dentists and so on had one piece of legislation to determine how um, um, they were to be regulated. So we had lots to do, um, I got heavily involved in writing teams, we developed policies and procedures in order to apply the Act correctly and apply the right functions at the right time. Didn't quite know it, but I was on the psychologist board for eight, no, eight and a half years, um, which was quite a long time, I think. Some prison sentences are longer. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I didn't feel like that, but it was, at the time just flew by. Um, and I did chair it for six years as well, which was a massive job. Um, and on top of that, um, towards the end of that time, I also chaired the Health Regulatory Authorities of New Zealand Group, which is all the, all, all the 16 regulatory authorities under one umbrella to share some um, common grounds. I have to say this was extraordinarily hard work um, done in the weekends and being really organised. Um, and I think I learned about three lessons out of this. Um, first, preparation, 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 um, and managing meetings and decisions. And it just makes it a lot easier, although all the work is obviously done before you go to a meeting. Um, second, I learned more than I thought I needed to know about surviving political processes and managing groups. Um, sometimes um, quite um, sharp politics. Um, and so I'd especially like to thank Steve Osborne, who's here today, and, and Goodhead for supporting me in the work, sort of literally propping me up at the end of a meeting and say, that's all right, carry on. Um, and I learned a lot about fundamentals of good governance and administrative law. And also that sometimes unpopular decisions have to be made, um, and learning how to do that fairly and robustly is a good skill to acquire. It certainly helped me in other roles, but a lot of hard work in long days. I then, after I left the board, I continued in a sort of bit of an advisory role or three um, and worked with the board secretariat, which is the operational arm of the board. Um, here I mostly um, chaired, have been chairing accreditation professional, of, of professional training programs that lead to, uh, to registration and quite a lot of investigative teams. A lot of that work has gone behind the scenes. It's not something you can go to work the next day and talk about. Um, but having a good grasp of processes has been essential. It actually turned out that this regulation work would open other international opportunities. Little did I know. Um, so especially in Australia, where I got great support from Australian colleagues on the Psychology Board of Australia, particularly Bryn Grenier, who was my equivalent um, in New Zealand. So that collegial relationship led me to chair the first ever joint meeting between the newly formed Psychology Board of Australia and New Zealand Psychologist Board. Um, so I think that's good that New Zealand led that. Um, and later I was also invited as a keynote speaker on international regulation standards for psychologists. So Bryn remains a supportive colleague and we share some research interests. And then, um, in 2013, another op important opportunity would directly lead to new research collaborations. So at that time, I was selected by Otago University to attend the Women in Leadership Program. And thank you to the Vice-Chancellor for being part of the funding of that scheme. Um, so that involves a block course meeting, which doesn't sound like much for a week, 
working with other academic strangers completely outside my research in my university. Um, and it has follow-up meetings, which I've been quite good at going to. Because at one of those meetings, at a coffee break, completely standing accidentally next to each other, I started up a conversation with Kate Deesfield, who's an academic lawyer from Auckland. And we quickly found, I think within about 10 minutes, minutes some shared research interests. And we went on um, to bring together another research team, um, Kate Kersey, a lawyer, starting a PhD, Marta Reichert, um, another trained lawyer towards the end of a PhD, and Michael Ipp, who is a public defender. He does apologise for the mugshot. Um, that's his my D card to get into the Auckland courts. Um, but a great team, and again, people I'd never met before, but we instantly clicked. And so we turned our attention to that act that I told you about because of its uniqueness. Um, perhaps internationally it's unique. Um, and there was a relatively um, absent body of research. I think there was one or two papers talking about one or two um, tiny aspects of it. So we were especially interested in the workings of the disciplinary processes heard by the Health Practitioners Disciplinary Tribunal. So what did this mean? Um, we were, in general terms, we were set about asking a whole lot of series of questions about how well is the Act working. We had a decade of legal decisions as a source data, and the reality of this is that we poured over thousands of pages of legal decisions. This isn't everybody's idea of fun, and it doesn't look like you're doing much when you're sitting at your desk, but you're just reading, 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 and processing. So persistence was needed. And this was, and still is, truly interdisciplinary work. I came from a science background and had to learn other ways of thinking about data and writing academic arguments. So those early lectures in philosophy have been especially handy in making me um, have, um, succeed in the transition. So we, we've been asking questions like, how do different health practitioner professions go equipped into hearings? Why might some professions possibly receive more severe sanctions than other um, disciplines for the similar transgressions, which I think is really interesting? Um, what's the public perception of and expectations of the Act and disciplinary tribunals? How is rehabilitation built onto penalties? And what name suppression principles are used in declining approving name suppression? And we also um, looked at health issues implicated in health practitioner lapses because um, as a health practitioner I'm interested in, well, people might have done um, sort of slightly unhelpful things, but what's the route out to um, rehabilitate people? And all these things have led to some um, publications. Um, so the work continues, unfortunately. Um, so we're now, um, please ask, um, we're looking at the health and disciplinary um, commissioner cases before the Human Rights Review Tribunal. And again, actually this is just a more paper, there's a lot more paper, um, but a applying a academic and um, professional eye on the um, consistency of decisions in atypical cases. And again, thank you for the University, New Zealand University's Women in Leadership Programme for providing the means for me meeting people I would never have come across um, outside my line of vision. So it just so happens that my experience in regulation and policy work has also helped in other roles because one of the final teams I really have enjoyed being part of is um, various teams on academic governance. And again, it's not everybody's taste, um, but it's about who you work with. Um, so I, uh, how I got onto this is my colleague Jean Hay-Smith, I referred to earlier, rang me up and said, I'm going on sabbatical, can you fill in chairing a board of studies? I said, okay. Um, not quite realising that this would lead to other things. So on her return, Jean said, ah, I've got other things to do, um, go for it. So I applied for the um, postgrad uh, studies associate dean role and got that. And I stayed in that role for eight years, actually, um, mixing um, with a whole group of people. There's many of these people here today, Casey Warden, Andrea Howard, and uh, Pat Craig, of course. So um, they seemed to have fun on days I wasn't there. Um, <laughs> but I 
I'm sure uh, they would have invited me if I'd been there that day. Um, but a really excellent group of people um, and very dedicated and ethical um, people to work with. So thank you. Well, we, I, I guess I got involved in a number of things. We did postgraduate academic procedures and guidelines. Again, not everybody's a cup of tea, but a bit of a problem if you don't have them. Um, looking at academic governance best practice. I got involved in chairing multiple um, campus boards and working parties. Managing impasses and improving efficiencies has been probably a big line of my work. Um, and university-wide governance collaborations and working across the divisions. And I've especially um, been doing a bit more of that since I took on the role of Associate Dean Academic when Pat um, found some interesting things to do. So um, I, I guess one of the big things we did, and this doesn't seem much, but I, I just wanted to highlight a sort of years of work summarised in two slides, which we actually changed the academic structure of the division in terms of boards from this to this. Now that doesn't look like much change, but actually it's thousands of hours saved among dozens of academics getting the same work done in quicker time. So um, I think the work that I did in um, previous governance roles and restructuring really helped with this. Um, and the, the good thing about it, actually nobody complained. Everybody said, thanks very much, got less meetings to go to. Um, so thank you for all those team members featured in the previous slide who helped me do all those things. So in conclusion, um, I think it's been a career of being given opportunities by others, um, and I'm very grateful for those other key people who have linked me to others who have linked me to others. I think teamwork has been the most rewarding work over any solo effort. Um, so I, I get a lot of pleasure of um, working with colleagues. And interdisciplinary, interprofessional collaboration really pays off. So it pays to get outside of your own little area and um, seek out others who might share the same goals but come up from a different perspective. And I've really enjoyed the serendipitous collaborations with people I've never met before and we've just taken a punt and got on with it. So finally, there's a, other people I'd like to thank, and that is people I've co-published with. Um, many people I've published a lot with, and then there's people of just a few publications, but it's, it's a really diverse, diverse group across many countries, and so thank you. And the final thing is, with thanks to the professional staff colleagues here, and in Dunedin and Wellington, who gave me advice and support in my teaching, um, in my board chairing, and achieving research outputs, and actually also helped me be in the right place at the right time. So there's one final team I want to mention. Um, this is my fishing team. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so when uh, the sun goes up, gone fishing, I really do mean that, um, I have gone fishing. Um, so there's been a series of teams that form comes together, and we don't get minutes. Um, and I could talk a great deal about those teams, but best not. Um, and, but it's a really important time for me to not be doing anything other than focusing on um, doing this. So thank you for the University of Otago for organising this, and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Paul Brunton, I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Health Sciences, and I'm delighted to be here tonight uh, to see Lois uh, give her inaugural professorial lecture. These are very special occasions for the university, and tonight was no exception. We learned a lot about Lois, early days, and uh, what she likes to do in her spare time, but we also learned about a personal journey in research, uh, and research that has real meaning, which I'm very, very keen on because it's research that improves the health of patients and has real impact. And also a story around the translation of research into public policy to improve the lot of New Zealanders. And I think that's fantastic as well. What Lois didn't tell you, she referred to it slightly at the end, is that in addition to all that she does, 
She's now the Associate Dean Academic in the Division of Health Sciences, and that role in itself is substantial. So I don't know how she finds the time to do all the things that she does. It's amazing, an amazing achievement. So on behalf of all of us, I would like to thank Lois, and uh, I think we should give her another round of applause. <laughs>